I'm going to introduce you to Glenn Yoder. Come on up, Glenn. And you can share your narrative. So because I'm often on the persecuted side, <laughs> I told my wife, I said, now, nah, you make sure to put this on Facebook tonight and, uh, because I'm taking you out to a nice restaurant. Well, they were all closed. And uh, so, but my wife does like Wendy's. So we ended up at Wendy's and everything would have been fine, but our granddaughter had been staying with the kids and we made the mistake of bringing a Wendy's glass along home that with some drink left over. <laughs> and when we got in the house, Esther said, you took Ida to Wendy's? <laughs> I said, don't put it on Facebook. <laughs> I didn't expect to hear about that again. <laughs> but listen, folks, I had a bad feeling about this. Earlier this morning, I heard Samuel say, today, we're going to start out with a joke. This meeting, in other words, with a joke. And sure enough, now he starts out, he introduces me. So the cat's out of the bag. Now everybody knows what Samuel really thinks of me. So in reality, I stand before you as a joke. So as it stands, it's up to you to make the best of it. But on a more serious note, today it is my job to talk. It is your job to listen. Now, if you get done before I do, please let me know. <laughs> but I enjoy to sing, but I haven't, I'm not musically gifted. But I still like the messages of these old songs. Here's a, here's a song that I borrowed from the collection of Lester Roloff's, one of his favorites. And uh, while I might not do the music justice, I want you to listen to the words. Um, it's, a, it's an old man addressing his beloved wife and is magnifying the church. Folks, the church is so important. And, and David said, one thing have I desired, and that will I seek after all the days of my life, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Sounds a lot like church to me. Well, wife, I found the model church and I worship there today. It made me think of the good old times before my hair was gray. The meeting house was finer built than they were years ago. But then I found when I went in, it was not built for show. The usher did not set me down away back by the door. He knew that I was old and deaf, and he saw that I was poor. He must have been a Christian man. He led me boldly through the long aisle of that crowded church, and he found me a pleasant pew. I wish you'd have heard the singing, wife. It had the old time ring. The preacher said with trumpet voice, let all the people sing. Oh, coronation was the tune, the music, upward road. And I thought I heard the angel choir strike all their harps of gold. My deafness seemed to melt away. 
My spirit caught the fire. I joined my feeble, trembling voice with that melodious choir and sang as in my youthful days and let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. I tell you, wife, it did me good to sing that old hymn once more. I felt like some wrecked seaman who gets a glimpse of shore. I almost wanted to lay aside this old weather-beaten form and to anchor in that blessed port forever from the storm. T'was not a flowery sermon, wife, just simple gospel truth. It fitted humble men like me. It suited hopeful youth. To win immortal souls to Christ, the earnest preacher tried. He talked not in separate creed, but Jesus crucified. Dear wife, the toil will soon be o'er. Our victory will soon be won. The shining land is just up ahead. Our race is nearly run. We're nearing Canaan's happy land, our home so bright and fair. Thank God we'll never sin again. There'll be no sorrow there. There'll be no sorrow there. In heaven above, where all is love, there'll be no sorrow there. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, nor has it entered the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. Amen. This morning we'll go to, our text is in Psalms chapter 40, in Psalms chapter 40. You know, that was actually quite an introduction. I thought it was a long way out here, but I would have drove that far just to hear that. <laughs> but flowery introductions are like expensive perfume. It's okay to smell it, but don't swallow it. <clears throat> I'm both honored and humbled to be given a, a, a slot in this very great meeting. I assure you, I'm not like the Amish preacher who stands up to preach and says, Ich bin leer, funny Herr Hufstanner. In other words, I stood up before you empty, quite unprepared. Indeed, I have purposed, I have prepared with great anticipation for this very special day. I believe everyone, every preacher needs to be stirred up, revved up, and studied up in order to be fired up. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He sent me to bind up the broken heart to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of their prisons to them that are bound. There's a lot of people bound today, not only lost people, but Christian people. Paul commanded young Timothy, study to show the self approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That requires studying. Now, there's three important dates that I think that everybody ought to be familiar with. October the 12th, 1492, is when Columbus discovered America. I'm so glad to be an American. July the 4th, 1776 is another date. That's when the United States became its own nation. What an important time. And then there's another date, September the 11th, 2001. That should never be forgotten in America. Sadly, uh, so many of our politicians have, uh, are doing business with the enemy today. Please allow me, though, to point out another date in America that uh, American history, very important to me. That would be January the 20th, 1950. That's when I discovered America. You see, that's when I was born. And uh, I, uh, that's when I got a body. And I'm so glad, I'm so happy to be alive. In Job you read, the Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. I thank God for this little old crippled body of mine. It's my only ticket to live in this beautiful creation that God has made for the pleasure of man. I feel sorry for the folks that are only half alive. The definition of that means they're mostly dead. <laughs> Every week they check the obituary before they put the coffee on the oven. Just because I'm crippled doesn't mean that I cannot enjoy 
the abundant life. Just because I'm crippled doesn't mean that I've got one foot in the grave. In fact, praise the Lord, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. Amen. Yes, I know because I weigh only 95 pounds soaking wet, you could rightfully say, Glenn Yoder's not much to look at. In fact, looking at some of you, I'm only half of a person, don't you think? <laughs> One day I came in on a high note. I told my wife, and this was a life goal for me, I always wanted to weigh over 100 pounds. I said, I weigh, I, I was on the scale, it went over 100 pounds. With a doubtful expression, she looked at me and said, really? And then she glared at me and said, what's in your pocket? <laughs> pockets. Uh-oh, I have forgotten to take the rocks out of my pockets. <laughs> Let's just say on that day, I got deflated faster than I was inflated. Today, I want to preach for a while on my testimony, my salvation testimony. Oh, I believe that every believer, every believer that has a salvation testimony, it's of the most important thing of the greatest value in your life. How nice it would be today if we could go along and hear everybody's story that is saved of how you got saved. Does not the Bible say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so? David said, come and hear all ye that fear the Lord, and I will declare what God had done for my soul. He also said, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his trouble. Well, that could be my life, so my life verse. I've got several life verses, depending what I'm preaching on. Later, David said, I was young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. I would testify to that truth today. Perhaps David was on a wooden wheelchair when he said that. I could imagine that. Uh, and he was, the crowd, everybody was walking by, and he was hardly noticed anymore. But he had a smile on his face as he said in Psalms 143, verse 5, I remember the days of old. I meditate upon all thy works. I muse upon the work of thy hands. I hope you can remember back when God did great things in your life. David might have been remembering when God, through his hands, killed a lion and a bear coming into the flock. Or the story of Goliath. It was not history, but he was remembering back. It surely must have put a smile on his face. And our text is uh, of a man that was raised in a godly home with God-fearing parents with a nation that was under God's law, under God's rule, under, wouldn't it be nice if America would be under God's rule today? But listen to David's testimony as we read here in Psalms chapter 40, read the first three verses. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. I, he brought me up out of, also out of a horrible pit, out of my clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Aren't those beautiful words? But I want you to note something here. He said he brought me up out of a horrible pit. I'd like to submit to you today that there are some religious pits that are just as deep and as hard to get out of than the sin pits of this world. Now, by way of a testimony, I hope to magnify the grace of God. I can identify with Paul when he said, I'm the least of the apostles, not me to be called an apostle. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed on me, is not in vain. Both my wife and I were born and raised Amish. Our four parents, we had four between the two of us, were born and raised Amish died Amish. Uh, we had eight grandparents, all of them born, raised, died Amish. In fact, we know of our 16 great-grandparents, all of them born, raised Amish, now buried in an Amish graveyard. Now, wouldn't you say that was a strong Amish heritage? Yes, it was predetermined, a predetermined conclusion that our live long day, we would be Amish, and eventually, we too would be buried in an Amish graveyard. 
So the Amish move a lot. You know that if you know them well. They're looking for something they can't find in a, in a community. It's only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they move a lot. But the last move that they make is the graveyard. I'm saying 42 years ago, we were an established Amish family. We had five children. And with a circle of close friends, we enjoyed a feeling of security, a feeling of security that comes from belonging to a special group, to a group that is different than everybody else. Uh, you could say a chosen people, chosen of God, and we were that chosen people. As a boy, I felt so lucky to have been born Amish. I looked at the outside people and I felt so sorry for them because we were going to heaven because we were Amish. And since being Amish was the way to heaven, I asked my dad one day, I said, Dad, why did Jesus have to suffer on the cross if being Amish is the way to go to heaven? Actually, I think that was a good question. I don't remember what the answer was, but I was equally disappointed when I asked my dad one day, I said, do we read about, what do we read in the Bible about the Amish? And I was disappointed. He said, we don't read about the Amish in the Bible. Well, I found several places that we do read about the Amish in the Bible. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And our iniquity, like the wind, have taken us away. That includes the Amish. And so at 18 years old, there we had a special ceremony in our church where we were so-called baptized. One preacher cupped his hand on the top of our heads, and another preacher put three shots of water on the top of our heads, and that was called a baptism. By the way, that's not a baptism. Uh, baptism means to be put under. It's a picture of the death, the burial. You don't bury a dead horse by putting a little sprinkling a little dirt on him. Try that. I recall thinking on that day, you know, if I could just die today, I would go straight to heaven because my sins have been washed away. Folks, there's not enough water in all the world, in all the rivers of the world, including all the oceans, to wash the sins away of one person. The Bible says, unto him who loved us and washed our sins away with his own blood, unto him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Yes, the forgiveness of sin is all about the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. All other. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I think I'll leave the singing to somebody else and I'll go on with the preaching. <clears throat> oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. One might ask, what do the Amish believe? What does an Amishman believe? Well, let me give you the short answer of that. An Amishman believes what his parents believed. Well, let's go, let's go back a step. What do the parents believe? The parents believe what the church believes. What does the church believe? In a long line of traditions, 325 years, that you picked up along the way. Isn't it time that somebody asked the question, what does the Bible tell us to believe? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He that believeth unto the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Folks, we're born under the wrath of God. We need to be delivered from underneath out of that. And the Bible says that Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power, become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. Believing is the key. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that has sent me has everlasting life and shall not come to condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Folks, it matters what you believe. Your eternal destiny depends. Where you're going to spend eternity depends on what you believe. Tradition. Tradition. Isn't it high time that some... that that we 
explain the difference between t- tradition and Bible doctrine. By the way, I believe in Bible doctrine. Some people say, well, in our church, they don't preach about doctrine because doctrine divides. I know it does. It divides between the believer and the unbeliever. And it's important that you know doctrine, doctrine, the word of God. So tradition was our guideline. It determined what was right, both in everyday life and in matters of faith. Now, tradition can be a blessing, but like religion, it cannot save you. The Bible says, for as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but, uh, oh, as received by tradition of your fathers, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Every Amishman is expected to follow without question, to follow and trust this religion that was handed down verbally by their parents, grandparents, and so forth. One of the questions that was asked for us when we left is, do you believe that grandpa and grandma were wrong? You know, uh, we're not to judge people, but I tell you what, if they didn't trust in Jesus Christ, they're not in heaven. I believe that there's Amish that are saved, and I hope that we get to heaven, we'll find out there's a whole lot more saved than what we, what we thought. But I'm telling you, it's very important that we don't go by feelings. We go by the truth of the Bible. And so, yes, as for me, I wondered. I doubted. I worried. I feared. And I pondered what is truth. I simply didn't know. And then God sent a man. Let's call him a messenger. That's what he was. And he had a salvation message and a salvation testimony. He had a zeal for the Lord, and it would forever change my life. It would forever change the life of my wife. It would forever change the life of our father, having great impact on our children, and it would affect, today we have 30 grandchildren. And as young as I look, you probably don't believe it, but I got seven great grandchildren. That was not the time to laugh. Here I pause to say, oh, the power of one testimony. Sometimes I've asked my fellow Baptist preachers, nobody, no Baptist ever came knocking on our door telling us about the gospel. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses did. The Mormons did, not telling about the gospel, but about their religion. Why didn't you come? They said, well, we thought there was an impenetrable wall between the Amish and the outside people. Let me tell you, every wall has got cracks in it. And what Mr. Hasty did in my life, he had a hammer and a chisel to hammer the word of God. He kept chiseling away at the crack. And one day that, that whole wall came crumbling down. Hallelujah. Uh, Carl Hasty was a retired, he was retired, but he hauled the Amish on his side. And uh, uh, by the way, you know, the ultimate sin for an Amish man is to drive a car. But the Amish love to ride in a car. How's that? Here's some Amish logic for you. Driving a car can send you to hell. But if you pay somebody to do your sinning for you, who's going to hell anyhow, <laughs> that's quite okay. Mr. Hasty was different than every other, any other driver that we had. He always had a Bible on his dashboard. And uh, talk about a captive audience. We'd be going down the road for just a mile or two. And he said, I'm so glad I know that I know that I know I'm going to heaven when I die. I said, well, you can't know that for sure, Mr. Hasty. We just hope so. He said, would you take that Bible and open it up to 1 John 5, 13 and quote it to me? Read it to me. These things have been written unto you that believe on the name of Jesus Christ, that you might know that you have eternal life, and that you you might believe on him. Believing there is so emphasized. I had never heard that. Never heard it be preached on either. But some weeks later, I was prepared because I thought a lot about it. And the next time he talked about, started to talk about the Bible, I said, well, I know one thing. You've got to have good works in order to go to heaven. How many of you think he had a couple verses for me? (laughs) He said, would you look up Titus 3, 5? Not by works which, 
works of, that, of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's exactly what we would do if, if we could earn it ourselves. And so, oh, by the way, let me name what our good works were. Let's consider them. Our good works were not having electricity. Our good works, part of that was not having phones. Sometimes I wish I wouldn't have one today. But, by the way, you can shut them off. If somebody's, if somebody's phone goes off during this preaching, I've got a glass of water behind here that will pass up to you and you drop your phone in there and it will stop ringing. <clears throat> Uh, refrigerator, not having a refrigerator. That was part of earning our way to go to heaven. I still thank God when I open the refrigerator and all the leftovers are cold and not half rotten when we eat them. The only running water we had is when Dad said, run out to the well and fetch a pail of water. And then there was all the blue laws. But listen, with this in mind, that we are earning our way to heaven, it was not that hard to live the Amish life. I could be an Amishman before the sun goes down tonight if I knew that was the way to go to heaven. Actually, tradition can be a great blessing, but how many of you know that Satan is a master at turning blessings into a curse? Only God can turn a curse into a blessing. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw not of me with their mouth and honor of me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain... Do they teach the doctrine? Do they worship me teaching the doctrines of man in vain? In fact, the first part of that chapter, the Bible says, Then came the scribes and Pharisees of Jerusalem, saying to Jesus, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands before they eat bread. Now, when somebody's trying to corner you with questions, sometimes instead of giving an explanation, or giving a, a speech, it's okay to ask a question back because that's exactly what the Lord did. He didn't answer that question. He asked them a question. He said, then why do ye transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Tradition is not the answer. Amen. As if yesterday, I, could, I remember asking Mr. Hasty, are you saying that all my Amish ways, my Amish lifestyle, doing these things the hard way, Plowing takes me two weeks to plow my little field that the neighbor does in less than 30 minutes. Uh, driving an open buggy down the road in zero weather. And I was driving along, I said, Lord, I'm doing this for you. Boy, did that ever change. I still thank God for the windshield of my car. Mr. Hasty, when I asked that question, he looked at me eyeball to eyeball. He said, all for nothing. I asked him, is it all for nothing? He said, all for nothing as far as salvation is concerned. Then he explained the phrase that Jesus made on the cross when he said, it is finished. Talking about the glorious plan of salvation. Yes, he paid it all. It was a few days later that the impact of this verse hit me. And I quit trusting in my works but trusting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my dad was 50 years old when he drew the lot and became a preacher. And uh, he was very hardcore Amish and uh, in a very conservative community. And that, but uh, when he became a preacher, he was very serious. Many times, 4 o'clock in the morning, you'd find him studying his Bible. See, the Amish can't preach with an open Bible. That would be a sin against God. Try to figure that one out. But it was not long until my dad started to preach outside the box, shall we say. I believe that this prepared us to be more receptive and daring when the gospel was brought to us, his children. At the age of 65 years old, my dad and mom, dad being a bishop by that time, followed us out of the Amish religion. Mind you, being a bishop in the Amish is the highest position that a person can have. It's a place, a place of power. Dad walked away from all of that. He was a nobody when he came out here in this society. But I'm so glad that he did what he did. There's a heavy price to pay for leaving the Amish. I'm talking about an emotional price. It's called shunning. 
My wife is the oldest of 14 children. Many of my family came out with us, but not so with her. Never again. And by the way, she practically raised some of her siblings, being the oldest in the family. But never again would she be invited to a wedding. We couldn't go to, even we were told not to come to their funerals. The year was 1988. Our kids were in school. That was four years after we came out. It was 12 o'clock at noon. And uh, we were just sitting down to eat our meal. And I said, oh, honey, Paul Harvey comes on right at 12 o'clock. Let's listen to Paul Harvey as we eat our meal. How many of you remember Paul Harvey? Raise your hand. Thank you, thank you. Majority of you are in my class. Tells me how old you are. <clears throat> Paul Harvey has been on the line, you know, for a long time. But uh, Paul Harvey was in a very important voice in America. Listen from coast to coast to listen to. And he started in like this. He said, an 18-wheeler run over a horse and buggy near Peoria, Indiana. The husband was thrown clear of the reap, but the wife, the mother of 11 children, is dead. I jumped up from my chair. I said, my sister lives close to Peoria, Indiana, and she's got 11 children. And then I sat back down. I said, no, it's got to be somebody else. I jumped up again, and I paced the floor. My wife said, well, you used to live there 15 years ago. You still got the neighbor's phone number. Why don't you call and find out? I did call, and I asked, when the, an when the phone answered, I asked, is my sister and her family okay? There was a pause at the other end. And then she asked me the question, you mean you didn't hear? It was my sister that was killed by a semi driving over her because they refused to, to have the, they went to jail before they had put on the emblem. And finally, the governor of Indiana said to let him go. Always somebody else seems to suffer for wrong decisions made by leaders. So we went to that funeral, and we were, of course, marginalized, shunned. Let's go on. The first time we went, we visited Philadelphia Baptist Church. We visited that church because there was a flyer had been sent out in the mail telling there was going to be an ordination at the church. A preacher is going to be ordained. I said to the others, I said, we've got to see this. We've been out for a couple months, been excommunicated. We were just meeting together and, and try to edify one another and sing some hymns and read some scripture. I said, we've got to, let's see this. So we, we uh, uh, were total strangers. We hired a driver to take us. And uh, there was three of us couples. We left our children home because we didn't know what we was going to meet. And uh, this young pastor that was being ordained had never seen any Amish people. We came in, we came inside the door, nobody came running up to us and say, thanks for coming, thanks for my answering my invitation, because we, we came because of that flyer in the mail. So we just stood there. And later I found out that one of the visiting preachers from Michigan said, uh, Pastor, looks like you got some visitors back there. Are you going to go back and shake their hands? He took one look at us, being from Texas, never saw any Amish. He said, hmm, they might be troublemakers for the ordination today. He didn't come back and shake our hands. Well, we found ourselves seats. And on that day, we heard real preaching, gospel preaching. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the Bible says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return void unto me, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And prosper in the two, in a thing where I send it. It was sent there. It went into our hearts. And my, what a difference it made. They, asked, they had that young preacher and his wife come up on the platform. They asked him 65 doctrinal questions. He answered every one of them. And many of them he gave a verse to justify his answer. Well, the last song was him was sung. The song leader said, everybody's invited to a potluck dinner over at the fellowship hall. This was a cold day in January. We had hired that driver to take us. When we got there, I wanted to pay the driver. And she said, oh, no, I wouldn't charge you to take you to church. Well, later we found out she was a backslidden member of that church. She should have went in with us. But now we looked at each other at that invitation, and our heads automatically nodded. If there's one thing Amish have in common with Baptists, they have a healthy appetite. When we got over to the fellowship hall, I made sure I got to sit beside Earl Jones, who was the preacher that day. I must have asked him a dozen questions. That, that afternoon, he went to the preacher, and he said, Pastor, you got some people here that are hungering for the word of God. You got to take care of them. 
And believe me, 9 o'clock the next morning, he was out at our house. He said, would you like if we'd have a Bible study every Tuesday night? And I said, would we? Yes, indeed. We filled the house up, and he came and taught us. He was just 27 years old, and I now think back uh, the courage that he had and the wisdom that he had. To this day, our hearts are stirred with many precious memories. As David said, I remember the days of old. I meditate upon thy works, I muse on the work of thy hands. Yes, it was most unusual for Pastor Stowe wanting to be ordained at the receiving church. Most pastors want to be ordained by the sending church. So was this a coincidence? Ah, no, this was orchestrated by God, I do believe. We still stand amazed to see how the Lord fitted that all together. I declare with the psalmist when he said, this is the Lord's doings, it is marvelous in our eyes. Folks, if you marvel at the work of God in your life and in your, the life of your, history of your life, uh, you'll always have something to marvel about. And so, if you consider this, oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. The Amish are a society within a society. They're a world apart in culture. And those coming out, breaking away, free Breaking free may experience a culture shock. Many of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but there's also some funny things that happen along the way that you might have encounters. Uh, excited about a family that I had led to, invited to come to church, they came, and so I always made sure I would talk with them, with him. And I, um, I asked him what they would do the day, the week before, and I said, well, so what did you do yesterday, uh, Luke? was his name. He said, well, my wife and I went out cruising. I said, you went out what? He said, cruising. I said, what's that? Um, like driving around without a particular destination. I said, uh, you mean going somewhere without getting there? <laughs> he said, pretty much like that, yeah. Listen, my experience was, if an Amishman wants to go somewhere, he's got to go out and chase the horse down in the pasture. He's got to bring him in and feed him. He's got to brush him down. He's got to hitch, harness, put the harness on him, and then hitch him up. And when the Amishman hits the road, he knows where he's going, and he's got a purpose in going. <laughs> Some things we just didn't understand. It took us a while to learn that. One time, a group of men were huddled together after church service. They were excitedly talking about a conversa in a conversation. I wonder what chapter and verse they were, I wondered what they were talking about, so I moved in closer. And as I moved into the circle, they included me. They were talking about the Indy 500 races. And he said, you don't know about that? I said, no. I said, help me out. And so they told me, yeah, it's this big racetrack, and they drive at breakneck speed, 150 miles an hour. I said, don't the cops stop them? <laughs> and he said, and they drive and drive for 500 miles. I said, so where did they get on and where did they get off? Oh, they get off the same place they got on. <laughs> Folks, if I drive 500 miles, it better not get, be getting off the same place I got on. <laughs> There's some things we're hard to understand. We uh, first... Sundays we went to church, we had some babies, some little ones that were still in diapers. Well, they ended up in the, over at the nursery. And so these nursery workers said, oh, look at these beautiful little girls. Let's put some bows in their hair, and, they made, and let's, let's make them really look like little girls. And they were having such fun with them, and somebody said, uh-oh, there needs to be a diaper change. Uh-oh, it's not a girl, it's a boy. <laughs> because these little girls were these little boys were wearing dresses. They thought they were little girls. They thought that's strange. To this day, some things in our society don't make real good sense. The Amish, there was an Amish school teacher. I was an Amish school teacher for 14 years. But when we left the Amish, I was without a job. And so my options were very limited being crippled. Most Amish, when they leave the Amish, they're good carpenters. They can build, and they, their work goes right on. Not so with me. And so breaking away with them, the Amish left me without a job. But one of the school teachers from the public school came to our church. And one day she came to me rather excited, and she said, Mr. Yoder, 
the three families, the kids of the three families he sent to our church, they are, they are really good. They're ahead of our kids in a lot of areas. She said, you ought to come and teach in our school. Ooh, that made me smile. I said, what time on Monday morning would you like me to be there? Oh, she said, no, no, no. You'd have to go, go to school for four years and get educated on how to teach. <laughs> Ma'am, I thought you just, never mind. <laughs> in, at two, almost three years old, uh, 1952, I contacted polio. This affected every area of my life. I was educated in one room schoolhouse where all eight grades were taught. I failed the eighth, I failed the third grade. And you ask, why did you fail the third grade? Because I was unbearably dumb. That was before political crack crowd came along and just passed kids along, threw them in special ed class for a while and passed and graduates them when they can't even read their own diploma. So my younger brother, Levi, he was much brighter than I. He was a grade or two behind me, but he caught up with me and we ended up in the same grade. How's that for being embarrassed? Never fret, folks. Years later, I would pass him up. He's still a Southern Baptist. I'm an independent Baptist. <laughs> By nature, I was an active, active child. To be different was most painful for me. You see, the manhood of an Amishman, his maturity is measured how strong you are physically. And I simply did not measure up. As a teenager, I was worried, would ever a girl trust in me to be able to provide a living for the family? In fact, I had doubts about that myself. But I knew I didn't want to be single. Now, when Miss Ida came along, she put all those fears to rest once and for all. I wish I'd have time to go through that story. But she, I'll, I'll just make it short. She said that I was a heap smarter than my peers. She even suggested they were more crippled from the neck up than I was from the neck down. <laughs> now, while I love that, I love to hear that. In fact, I asked her to repeat it to me from time to time. <laughs> but I, even though I knew it wasn't true. Now, have I told you, by the way, that my wife is the sunshine of my life. She is the delight of my nights. She is my crown jewel. She is my pearl of great price. Her voice is the sound of music and her kisses. Never mind about that. <laughs> She's the sugar of my, in my coffee and yes, the cherry on the top of my ice cream. Now, wait, what was I talking about? She's, <laughs> she's also a distraction to me sometimes. But dealing with my handicap in school was most perplexing. We played games of competition. Back in those days, we celebrated winners. That was before the political correct card came along and said you're supposed to celebrate losers. We selected two team captains in our team. They chose sides till everyone in the school was chosen from top to bottom of the grades. Now, would you like to guess who was the last one chosen every stinking time? Sometimes the captains would even negotiate. You take him, we'll let you go to base first. About that time, I would say, you know, I'm not feeling so well. I think I'll just watch. And they liked that. But I'd go to the sideline, and I'd feel sorry for myself, and I would pout about it. And I, I, I'd ask God, why do I have to be different than the others? I didn't want to run faster than the other boys. I just wanted to run as fast. I just wanted to be part of it. Rejection is a very, very painful thing to go through. Oh, how I wondered, how would it feel to be needed? How would it feel to be wanted on the team? How would it feel for a captain to look at me and choose me? It would not be until years later that I found a beautiful promise made by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in the Bible, in the book of John, chapter 15. He said, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you that you should go forth and bring fruit and that your fruit should remain. Glory, hallelujah, another captain from another team, I'm saying the heavenly team, reached down all the way down and chose this little crippled old me. Praise the Lord. Never again would I suffer the pain of rejection. I understood what it feels like 
to be chosen. A team that I'll never get kicked off. Praise the Lord. Hold my mule while I shout. Hallelujah. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blesses the man that trusteth in him. I have made peace with who I am and with my handicap. Here and now, I cannot run. I cannot jump. I cannot climb. I cannot do what others do. But just wait and see what I'll do when I get my new body. <laughs> Paul spoke about this when he said, for we know when this earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Hallelujah. But listen, folks, more than getting a complete body, I'm looking forward to having a body that is no longer inclined to sin, to have a heart that is not leaning to the left. Until then, I want to do whatever I can, wherever I can, whenever I can, for as long as ever I can. I always wanted, from little on up, to raise my hands. This is all I can do today, and then you just fall back down again. I wanted to raise my hands. Well, I cannot do that, but by the grace of God, I praise the Lord. By his grace, I can raise my voice. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sin. Listen, folks. There's so much that I can't do, but I want to focus on what I can do. I want to preach Jesus Christ until I drop dead. Dear God, help me to focus on what I can do and not fuss and fret about what I cannot do. Ecclesiastes 9 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. In other words, give it all you got, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whether to thou goest. We're on our way there. So time is precious. One thing that all of us in this room have in common, all of us, no matter where you're from, what you about, no matter how old you are, we have this in common. We have some time left. Some of, us much, some of us much less than others, but we all have some time left. Time is so precious. Nothing, and I mean nothing in this world, matters or has value to the man who has run out of time. Ben Franklin said, do not squander time, for that's what life is made up of if you think about it. A poet wrote this, the clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop, at late or early hour. To lose one's wealth is sad indeed, to lose one's health is more, to lose one's soul is such a loss as no man can restore. The present is only, we only, the present is only what we have now. So live, love, labor with a will. Put no trust in the present, in the future, for the clock may then be still. I want to close with a single jingle about time. You be, might be able to remember this. It's simple, but it's got profound meaning. In time, take time, while time doeth last. For time is no time, once time is past. Thank you, Joe. It was telling me Climb out of the boat Take a walk on the way Some places you'll never go Till you step out on faith Don't fear the wind or the rain Jesus called you now go Others might think you're insane Just climb out